Hello, how are y'all? And welcome to our online lecture. Now, what I want you to do with this is follow along in the textbook, do some things in the textbook. So if you don't have your textbook, stop the tape, go get it, come back and pick up with the tape right here where you left off. All right. We're going to talk about measures, about measuring exposure to exchange rate fluctuations, and should we hedge against these exposures? All right. Before we begin this, I want to review two theories with you that are important in understanding this. The first theory that I want to review is agency theory. What does agency theory tell us? Well, if you think back, agency theory tells us that management in, in a corporate setting may very well have an incentive to manage the company for their benefit instead of the shareholder's benefit like they're supposed to. And because of information asymmetries, and asymmetric is a fancy way of saying different, because of information differences. Management knows more about what's going on in the company than the shareholders do. And so for this reason, management is often able to successfully manage the company for their benefit rather than the shareholders' benefit. There's your review of agency theory. And remember, to completely explain agency theory, you have to talk about management having the incentive to run the company for their benefit, but you need to also talk about the fact that it's limited information, asymmetric information, and that gathering information can be very costly that gives them the ability to do this. The next thing that I want to talk about is modern portfolio theory. Modern portfolio theory tells us that investors diversify. Remember, Modern portfolio theory says investors decide what return they're looking for, how much risk they're willing to take on, and then build a diversified portfolio with that risk profile. It should produce the return they're looking for, and there is an excellent chance that If it, if it if some of the investments go bad, and they probably will, the investor has already planned for this when they built their diversified portfolio. This means that whatever risks the multinational company had, the investor took into account when he selected the portfolio, and he built a portfolio that hedged himself against that risk. And remember, hedging is really risk management. And if you have profits that are going up and down like this, what hedging tends to do is maybe you have a big band in which it fluctuates and it cuts off the highs and the lows to where the profits or the earnings fluctuate in a smaller range. Which means that when we decrease our volatility, we may be turning ourselves into a completely different investment than what the investor meant to buy. So keep those two things in mind. If you're not clear on agency theory, and if you're not clear on modern portfolio theory, go ahead and stop the tape right now. Spend some time on the internet. Look it up. Make sure you understand them. Okay, you're back. So I'm assuming you're with me. On, on portfolio, modern portfolio theory, and on agency theory. One other thing we have to remember. Remember what I told you earlier about hedging and speculating and whatever you do, you need to make sure you disclose in your prospectus so that investors know whatever it is they're buying when they buy your company. Okay? All right. That being said, I'm going to give you three different arguments that have been made. And these are really three different non-frivolous arguments as to why 
as to why hedging and managing exchange rate risk may not build a lot of shareholder value. The first thing is the investor hedge argument. The investor hedge argument relies on modern portfolio theory and on agency theory to be made. And what the investor hedge argument says is it says, hey, we the investors already diversified when we built our portfolio. You don't need to spend our money on a hedge. We want you to spend our money on doing whatever projects it is your company normally do, does. But don't turn around and spend your money and expend our resources on a hedge. Expend our money and expend our resources on projects. We hedged when we built our portfolio. You're not adding value. Now, the fact of the matter is most multinational companies do hedge. And most multinational companies, at least in the finance department, are very aware of the argument that I just made. They understand it, and they understand it fully, and they understand it completely. So, how do I justify hedging in light of this? Well, I can say, number one, I as the multinational company really have superior information about what my exposures are. And I can gather the information and put the information together at a much lower cost than you, the shareholder, can. Therefore, I can build our hedged portfolio at a much lower price. Okay, it's the first answer to the investor hedge argument. And the second answer is this. A lot of hedges are really expensive and have to be bought in really large blocks. And you might own 100 shares of my stock and I'm exposed to the euro, well, you can't really afford to go out and buy a derivative to hedge the risk that you acquire from 100 shares of stock. So I can do this at far less cost than you are. So the two responses to the investor hedge argument are better information, lower cost hedging. This is true. It might be. It makes sense. The empirical evidence is mixed. When we look at companies talking about we have superior information to investors, the only area where the empirical evidence seems to be pretty clear is when the company says, I have superior information and I can use this superior information to speculate effectively that very often they can't, and the record of corporate speculation building shareholder value is a little disconcerting. Um, why is that? Well, because what you find is a multinational company tends to have very superior information about a tiny little segment of the market. Not the whole market, but the tiny little segment of the market. And they hedge and they invest and they put that tiny little piece of information into the market, but it's not the whole big picture. They lack the big picture, and that's why they're less successful at, at speculating. But we're not talking about speculation. We're talking about hedging, and we've been through the investor hedge argument. Now let's take a look at the currency diversification argument. A companies tend to either be multinational in a big way or not really very multinational at all. If they're multinational in a very big way, then they're not going to be exposed to one currency. They're going to be exposed to multiple currencies. And these multiple currencies kind of set off against each other. Just stop for a minute and think about a company like Exxon. How many different currencies do you think it's exposed to? A bunch. And do you think these currencies maybe set each other off? That would mean that just by going through your ordinary course of business and diversifying, and remember, diversification is one of the risk management techniques we always talk about in finance, just by diversifying, just by doing that, just by going through your ordinary course of business, 
build up this diversified portfolio of currencies. They set off against each other. You hedge. You don't need to be spending additional money on hedging. You need to go spend your additional money doing projects that will bring profits to us, the shareholders. Okay. Is this true? Well, maybe. The strongest argument against it is most foreign currencies tend to be pretty highly correlated in the way they move against the dollar. And remember, different doesn't equal diversified. Diversified means uncorrelated. If you have BP, Shell, and Exxon in your portfolio, you have three different stocks, but except for your management risk, you haven't diversified very much. And there might be some truth to this type of argument when we are talking about currencies also. Okay. The final argument I want to talk about is a stakeholder diversification argument. What are the responses to that? Well, it is basically the same as the investor hedge argument, except instead of applying it to shareholders, you're applying it to all stakeholders, and you're saying all these different stakeholders are diversified, just like the investors are, and for that particular reason, you don't need to go ahead and spend money on additional hedges, okay? It's just the investor hedge argument applied to all stakeholders. <coughs> all right. Now, most multinational companies, most, not all, but most, do hedge. The argument most make for hedging is a superior information argument. When we think about how costly information may be together, there may be some validity to this. If your hedging is a long-held policy you've done for years and years and years, then the investor would have taken that into account when they put you in your portfolio. And so this is probably why it's routinely done. But understand, hedging like all risk management does make it possible, does make it possible to make a reasonably strong argument against it. Okay, now what would I like you to do? I'd like you to, I'd like you to go to page 330 in your textbook. And I'd like you to see if you can answer question one on the self-test. And just see if you can answer that. And you'll find the answer in Appendix A, but I would suggest you try to answer it first. Then you go look at Appendix A. So let's stop the tape and let's go do this. Okay, you're back. So I am a, assuming that you stopped the tape and went and answered question one. And then you looked in the appendix and then you looked at the answer. And if you're still confused, I'm also assuming that a week from Tuesday, you're going to bring your questions to class and we'll go through it and see if we can answer it. What I want to talk to you about now is three different types of exposures that multinational companies tend to have. The first thing we have is transaction exposure. Transaction exposure is an exposure to exchange rate risk through contractual obligations. You have a contract that is denominated in a foreign currency. In order to assess your transactions exposure, you just have to look at the net cash flows from that contract and then see how various different exchange rate fluctuations would impact those cash flows. Transactions exposure is probably the easiest to get your mind around because you got to find two things to find it. One, you got to find a contract, and that contract's got to be denominated in a foreign currency. Okay? You see how this isolates it? And because this isolates it to one discrete event, then all we have to do is turn around and look at 
our exposure based on this contract. Now, yeah, there's some potential problems with this. Like, what if I got a whole bunch of contracts? Do they set off against each other? <laughs> I hope you thought of that. And if you did think of that, you're thinking right. You're thinking about diversification, reducing risk. And that's really just the currency diversification argument applied to these contracts. And if you have multiple contracts, you choose to hedge your transactions exposure, you're going to do that based on the same answers you give to the more generalized arguments I gave you at the beginning of the lecture. All right, the next thing we want to talk about is economic exposure. Economic exposure is explained on page 322. I want us to read the definition together and then I want you to think for a minute about just how broad it is. Okay? The value of a firm's cash flows can be affected by exchange rate movements if it executes transactions in foreign currencies, comma, receives revenue from foreign customers, comma, or is subject to foreign competition. Okay, think about that for a minute. In today's world, in today's business world, as globalized as, as it is, who isn't subject to foreign competition? Well, the answer to that is pretty much nobody. That's why calculating economic exposure often becomes very important. You're guaranteed to have it because it's so broad. You have transactions in a foreign currency, you have foreign customers, or you have foreign competitors. Just about any firm of any size is going to meet that definition. And so what this means to you is that you do have economic exposure and the decision that you've got to make is when we add all of this up, is it worth the effort of hedging against it? Okay. If you import, if you export, if you have foreign customers. Just an ordinary course of business. Not tied to a particular contract, but imports, exports, ordinary course of business, or foreign competitors. Then you have economic exposure. And finally, we have what is known as translation exposure. Translation exposure is about we own assets in a foreign country. Let's say we have a refinery in Japan. If I have a refinery in Japan, how's that refinery going to be valued? In yen. What do I have to do every quarter? I have to take that refinery, valued in yen, translate it back to dollars, and put it on the books as part of the capital stock that I own. So do you see how if I have significant investments in foreign countries, if I don't sell the investment, I've just got to value it every quarter. And I've got to translate it from the currency where the asset's located back into dollars. Do you see how that is can cause bounces in my book value even though nothing changed with the company? And so I might need a hedge to protect me if this were to happen. Okay? Maybe the currency appreciates, maybe it depreciates. That changes my book value. I don't want large, unexplained changes in my book value. All right. What would I expect you to remember from this? What I expect you to remember from today is this. The arguments against hedging how to use financial theory to make those arguments, how to answer those arguments, and start thinking about what you believe. Do you believe hedging is justified or not? Okay, and why? Second, what the different types of exposures we have are. And how 
those different types of exposures can come back and impact the value of our firm. One of the things I would like you to do after you turn the tape off is I would like you to go back to page 331 and look at transaction versus economic exposure and see if you can answer that. And then take a look at number three, factors that affect a firm's transactions exposure. See if you can answer that. Try, do your best, and bring your questions about question one and question three with you a week from Tuesday when you come to class. Okay, I'll have another video up here for you to look at on Thursday. It's going to talk some more about this subject. Make sure you read the book. Make sure you do the exercises. Make sure during this week you think about all of the questions you have. So when you come to class a week from Tuesday, we can begin to try to answer those questions and make sure you understand these materials before you take the test. Okay, good luck, and I'll have another videotape up for you again before Thursday. Thank you.